Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the SAG AFTRA Foundation's Conversations at Home program. My name is Joe Utiki. I'm the editor of Awards Line magazine at Deadline, and it's my great pleasure to be your host for this very special conversation with Kerry Mulligan. But before we begin, I'd like to note that the foundation has set up a COVID relief fund in order to support thousands of union performers who are going through tough times. Since last March, thanks to your donations, the foundation has given over $6.4 million in emergency aid to more than 6,900 performers and their families. If you're a SAG AFTRA member and need help, please ask. And if you ca can help, please give. You can find more information down in the description of this video, and we thank you for your support. Now, without further ado, I am thrilled to introduce you to our guest today. Kerry Mulligan is a Tony nominee, a two-time Academy Award nominee, a four-time Screen Actors Guild Award nominee, and a BAFTA winner. In nearly 20 years as an actress, she has fast become one of the most sought after stars of her generation. And her work with directors like Lone Scherfig, Nicholas Winding Refn, Steve McQueen, Dee Reese, and the Coen brothers includes some of the most indelible films of the 21st century. She's also made a name on stage on Broadway and in London's West End. I will never forgive myself for missing her as Nina in Chekhov's The Seagull in 2008 and subsequently getting to witness her extraordinary range in David Hare's Skylight in 2014 and Dennis Kelly's Girls and Boys in 2018 has really only magnified my regret. Um, but of course, I'm, I'm barely scratching the surface of a truly thrilling bo body of work, which I'm, I'm super excited to dig into deeper today. Uh, and so to spare her any further blushes, please welcome Kerry Mulligan. Welcome. Thanks. Um, now, after that, you know, incredibly sycophantic uh, introduction there, I, I'd really like to start by by asking about your life before acting. Uh, you were born in London, I think. You lived in Germany for a spell when you when you were young. How did the young Kerry Mulligan discover acting? Uh, at school, um, we went to the first play I ever did was we. I went to the international school in Dusseldorf and uh, in Germany, and my brother was in a production of The King and I. Uh, and I was too young to be in it. They weren't letting my year group in. And we went to go and pick him up from rehearsals one day, my mum and I, and I watched them do a scene on stage and I was distraught that I wasn't allowed to be in it. And um, apparently kicked up a massive fuss and then they sort of bent the rules and let me do it. And that was my first play. Wow, and, and, and I mean, you know, the writing on the wall there at that point then, I think. <laughs> I um, think oh no, I've got... <laughs> This precocious little kid, uh, but I loved it. I just loved it, and yeah, it was a you know it was a real kind of and you know it was a musical theatre that's the passion that started for me more than anything else. I just wanted to do musicals. Well, then why haven't you? I'm sorry to like jump ahead, but it seems like I mean, <laughs> I, I, you know, I when I at school I did you know, and I did them. Sort yeah, of, yeah. I can't sing well enough to do musicals. I can sing well enough to sort of you know sing in a choir, but I'm not a singer like a proper singer. So, but I loved right. it. I mean, the whole world was musical theatre and I still love it. Am I, am I right in thinking there was a very special, I mean, a bit, little bit later, a very special trip to see Cabaret that kind of really like kicked things off in-, in, in, yeah, in, yeah. in... I, saw the, I saw the, it was Sam Mendes, um, that production, it was Sam Mendes, right? Yeah, at the, um, at Studio 54, I must've been about 14 and I went with my mum. Yeah, and that was sort of, that and I saw Kevin Bacon doing a one man show uh, on that same trip. Um, and I saw one other thing I can't remember, but yeah, that trip I think was sort of solid solidified it for me. Um, and I wanted to live in a sort of, you know, tiny apartment in New York and tread the boards and, you know, show up to auditions every day and like not get the job. And, you know, I really wanted to like live there kind of you know proper sort of struggling actor dream and how old would you have been at when, when you when you made that trip i was 14 yeah right 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 the big one the big kind of i think there was a moment um a sort of more i think you know because i was still living in the world of wanting to be in the chorus of les miserables because that was i'd seen it like four times by that point and i still want to be in the chorus of les miserables um who doesn't 
I mean, you know, you'd have to be mad not to. And um, but no, uh, uh, probably a year or two after that, I went to go and see Pete Postlethwaite at Riverside Studios in London in a production called Scaramouche Jones, which was a monologue, and um, and he was playing a, a clown as a play by Justin Butcher. I haven't read it for years, but he was. He, I, from what I remember, he's a clown and he's sort of telling the story of his life, and you know, he's sort of about to retire, um, and and. At the end of the play, he came out and I was expecting like 14 other cast members to come out and bow with him. And he came out to bow and I was like, what have you, you magician? How have you done this? It was just, I couldn't. Yeah. So that was, I think that was it. I was like that. I want to do that. Well, so uh, what were the paths for you then? I mean, you know, uh, uh, how complicated was it to try and figure out a way in? Well, I mean, you know, I, uh, in some in some ways hard in some ways sort of not you know I suppose I um I was very lucky to go to a school where um you know there was sort of uh my headmistress was I guess mates with Julian Fellows um who wrote Gosford Park and wrote um Downton Abbey and he came he'd, he'd won the Oscar for down for, for Gosford Park and he came to our school and he gave a talk on you know that and I met him afterwards um, because I was the head of drama, <laughs> which is, I'm still really proud of. Emma Corrin later went to the same school as me. I think she might have been. Oh, wow. I know. Um, but, you know, so I met him afterwards. And so I'd sort of, you know, he was the only actor I'd ever met. Um, and then I tried to get into drama school, got rejected from everywhere and ended up sort of in a bit of a situation where I didn't have any places at university because I'd sort of wasted them all on my drama school applications, all of which had not worked out for me. So at that point, I got hold of his address and I wrote to him and I asked him, you know, you know, I'm, I said, like, I'm, essentially, I'm reapplying to university, I'm heading to university, I know I don't really want to go, I know I want to act, but I'm not allowed, I can't really apply to drama school again, you know, what, what would you suggest? And so he you know, uh, he had had probably a million letters like that. And he and his wife had a dinner party for lots of people for about sort of 10, you know, kids my age who always wanted to be actors and writers and directors and whatever. And they said, go to this place in uh, at Riverside Studios, um, this, this theatre workshop called Young Blood Theatre Workshop. And I started going to that. Um, and they said, Gina J is casting Pride and Prejudice. And, you know, and I know they're looking for sort of young um sort of inexperienced or not not professional actors for for a couple of those sister parts so you should go and read for that so i went in and auditioned for that with um gina's assistant who kind of coached me robin he kind of coached me through the audition sort of kept on telling me to sort of do a little bit less because i think i was quite theatrical um and then that's how i you know that tape got me a call back and that got me my agent and you know so i was like incredibly uh lucky to be you know, for that string of events, but 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 hyper aware that that string of events were, was only really possible because you know of, of the privilege of my upbringing. So it feels a lot like um, you know I, I had a real shoe in, um, which I'm very aware of and very I'm very grateful for. But it, it strikes me too that there's a certain kind of tenaciousness required to to essentially say, um, you know, I, I've been. I, I won't put it in so fine a point, but but you know I've been rejected by every drama school in the country, but I still I still know that this is what I want to do, and I still want to pursue this. You know, like I think a lot of kids, you know, would would have their confidence knocked by that, and and you know, I suppose having that kind of strength of resolve is sort of uh, fundamental to to acting to a degree. I think so. I think I also just thought like yeah i'm not i wasn't good enough you know i kind of i remember sitting in the audition those auditions you have to watch everybody else audition at the same time and i remember sitting there thinking like they're way better than i am and i you know i don't have the goods and but i also knew there was nothing else i wanted to do and that it would have been a kind of a waste of time um and money to go to university and study like i think i was going to go and do english and theater studies or something like that you know and uh, um so yeah it was more just like I, there's nothing else i want to do i can't i don't have passion for anything else um so you know just plugging away but again like being in a very lucky position where i could fail and i could then just go back to my parents house and you know um 
so that that was sort of a buffer for me. Right, right. Well, Pride and Prejudice, I mean, an extraordinary first job to do, really. I mean, you know, like Judy Dench, Donald Sutherland, Keira Knightley, you know, this incredible uh, cast as well. It's, uh, it, and I would imagine quite a fortunate thing to have around you in, in, in your first job of, of just like, you know, kind of actresses of your generation, around about your generation that you could that you could sort of share experiences with in, in the Bennett sisters. Um, but but I mean, uh, describe for me, I suppose the, the 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 kind of the feeling of of stepping onto that set for the first time. I mean, I would imagine quite an overwhelming experience, having like not really worked in in a, on a professional set at that point. Yeah, I mean, I had no idea what I was doing, literally. Um, but it was you know, we had, Joe Wright was amazing. We had we had like more rehearsals than I've ever had for anything. You know, we had three weeks, three weeks of rehearsals. I think it was a whole week just for dancing, um, where we just did that, you know, cause there were so many dancers in, in the film. So we had a week of dancing and we had about two weeks of rehearsals. And on the first day of rehearsals, Judy Dench, Dame Judy Dench came over to me and I was sort of sitting on my own um, in the rehearsal space. And she said, she came over to me and she said, I believe we have the same agent. I'm Judy, nice to meet you. And I was like, <gasps> I just didn't know what to do with myself. Um, and it was just so nice and kind because I was, you know, no, I was 18 and I'd never been, a, you know, I'd never met a professional actor, let alone, you know, met Judy Depp or been in a film with anyone, you know. So yeah, I was completely, um, completely out of my depth. And I, and I just sort of attached myself to Jenna Malone, who was, incredibly experienced and um very confident and so much fun and i just decided i was just going to do everything that jenna did and just copy her basically um and and rosamund pike and kira and Tallulah and jenna and i just became you know really like sisters um mm -hmm. it was really lovely I, I I love, by the way, that you, you know you shared an agent, as you said there, with with Judy Dench. I mean, Tor Balfred, she also represents Daniel Day Lewis, and she represented John Hurt. I mean, incredible actors. What what do you think? I mean, describe how you, describe your first meeting with her, because it's been this like. I mean, she's still your agent to this day. I mean, it's been this incredible journey that you've been on together. Um, mm. But but how did that happen? I mean, that's just like a very unusual thing to happen. Yeah, it's cra I don't know. I mean, Gina, Gina sent her my audition tape. Um, and she, I think, I, I think she sort of st provisionally sort of was like, you know, kind of look like kind of keeping an eye on me, but not sort of technically looking after me straight away, because I literally had done nothing. And then before we started shooting Pride and Prejudice, I auditioned for a play at the Royal Court, a Kevin Elliott play. Um, and I got that. And then I think after that, we sort of made it official, but I don't really remember. I don't really remember it. I mean, what's so weird though, is that actually at that time when I was 18 and just signing with tour, Emerald Fennell, my now director of Promising Young Woman was working as her assistant. Oh, so wow. in the same room, like, you know, but we just, yeah, so strange. So it's not that I'd never heard that story before. Was this that story? And then there's also you were you were in something together and didn't realize it until just recently. Like a year later, we were both in an episode of Trial and Retribution, which we had completely forgotten about, where she kind of pushes me over and we have a fight in a nightclub and then I go home and get murdered. Fantastic. I didn't remember, I didn't remember at all. <laughs> yeah. I what a world. I mean, the coincidences, you couldn't, you couldn't make them up. But listen, we're going to come on to Promising Young Women. That's a little, it's a little yeah. further away in the timeline. Um, but but I, I'm very curious to know what you kind of learned on, on Pride and Prejudice, what the kind of the experience uh, was, uh, how formative it was as, a, as, a, as an actress, kind of stepping onto that set, having not done anything before, learning from these great people. Were you able to kind of, by the end of that shoot, at least have kind of more of a sense of, of what this job was going to entail? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I you know, it was really a masterclass, you know, getting to watch Donald and Judy Dench and, you know, Matthew McFadden and Kira and, you know, it was it was kind of um and I really, you know, there was so little pressure on me. I think there was one scene where I have like three lines and I, you know, I was terrified about my three lines, but you know, the rest of it really is just sort of, you know, hysterical laughter. Um 
but it was it was like summer camp you know i was and i and i you know it was we all stayed in hotels together and you know we were together for like 11 weeks and no one really went home or went away it's not like anything else i've really experienced since you know um and in a way i think it set me up a bit because i was like oh this is great this is what films are like that's all like this and actually you know we were it was a sort of very um kind of romantic um version of of what you know that of this what this work can be um but i think you know also just being around you know someone like kira who you know to, she really was the model of what it is and what it should be to be a leading lady um on set and i think just you know you learn that kind of stuff as well you know you learn what that is and actually it's not just having you you know being number one on the call sheet it's the way that you are with the crew it's the way you are with the other actors it's the way you make people feel comfortable and you know welcome and you know she was just such a model for that um and you know insanely famous at that point um particularly um but you know the most normal down-to-earth lovely approachable non-scary you know uh, person and yeah so that was that was kind of formative as well I do wonder how how important it is to have kind of people like that around you I mean you know uh, you were fortunate enough I, I guess to, to work with Kira again uh, you know you uh, I, I you can look at I mean there have been many people that you've been able to repeat with which is I, I have to imagine like when you're starting a new job it's kind of nice to have a familiar face around or, or two you know uh, but but how important is the community I suppose for you and and just you know the friendships that you make along the way yeah i mean really important um you know even i spoke to ros the other day rosman pike and she's now you know working and living in prague and um you know we've both now got kids and you know it's all it's so much has, has changed since we um even you know when we worked together on education but you know it, i think it's um it's you know those experiences can be really really special and an education certainly was and pride and prejudice obviously was so you know um it's you know when it goes well it really does feel like you've got a little community and also it's the kind of relationship i find where it doesn't matter if you don't see each other for a couple of years like there's still you fall straight back into you know the way that your relationship has always been which is very comforting for me mm -hmm. Well, you, you followed Pride and Prejudice up, uh, as you mentioned, that role at the Royal Court. You also did uh, Bleak House for, for BBC Television, which was a, a hugely starry production, very big deal at the time, I remember. Um, but it, it, it feels like those two projects, Pride and Prejudice and Bleak House, kind of started a trend for you that continues to this day. And as far as, you know, tackling period literature. <laughs> oh, my, I just really had to stop myself rolling my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I know. Well, you know, it's some of the best stories isn't it there's a reason the classics get retold um and you know bleak house was again a relatively low pressure part where i just got to be surrounded by incredible actors you know gillian anderson and charles dance and it was just you know um it was it was great anna maxwell martin you know she's one of my favorite actors on the planet and i got to be in scenes with her all the time and um so i think yeah, I, I was, and I loved the format of that because it was at that time kind of, you know, very, uh, it was very new, you know, it's, it, we, we now do costume drama a lot in this way, but, you know, back then um, it was like, you know, the idea of doing period drama with, you know, a handheld camera and in half hour episodes wasn't you know that's not really how these things were approached it was a lot more kind of like everything was a bit more sort of you know proper and prim and you know the the idea behind bleak house was that it felt like episodical in the way that dickens released it you know because it was released in episodes it was in so it was sort of people hungry for it the way that we are we want to binge things now and um so it felt really exciting to do it in that way and um but yeah, I, I, you know, again, I had no, I just sort of was like, ah, floating along, have a go at this, no idea what I'm doing, <laughs> fun, you know, just like, kind of hoping I wouldn't get busted. Right, right. 
So do you think, I, I'm curious, do you think, you know, you had a, you mentioned uh, that play 40 Winks you did at the, at the Royal Court. Was was theatre where, where it kind of really did start to click for you then? Because it, it you know, you that was a relationship that, that, that continued. I mean, like, you know, you, you've done, is it three or four plays now you've done at the Royal Court and you've had a... Um, yeah, three at the Royal Court. Yeah, right, right. I, I, I do wonder, like, because you know, you, you, as you said earlier, you kind of started with a kind of an idea of of stage uh, of stage performance, musical performance, and 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 I wonder if the theatre is is kind of a uh, a great a great chance to kind of like hone a skill. I think it definitely is that. I mean, I I, I felt it was weird because the first play I did. I felt massively out of my depth and felt very aware of not being trained. I think practically everyone else in the cast had gone to like RADA or gone to some, right. and I remember being, they brought someone in to help me with my voice. Cause I just wasn't, you know, I, I didn't know how to be, you know, to be heard on stage. Um, but yeah, it was when I did the seagull, I guess. So I was 21. That was the first time. It was kind of the first time where I was like, Oh, I think I can actually sort of, you know, that this isn't, I'm not just winging it, you know, the rest of the time I really did feel like right. I was trying really hard and, you know, and working really hard, but I didn't really sort of feel like I knew what, I, there was no sort of real, I was just sort of making it up as I went along. Um, whereas on The Seagull, I I understood a lot more of how how I was going to do it. And it was a long run. I mean, we did 12 weeks in London. Did we do? No, we did eight weeks in London. Then we did 16 weeks in New York. So um, a bit later on, um, but mm. that was, first time where I felt like I kind of knew what I a bit more what I was doing how do you think that that came is it is it the process of, of repetition is it the chance to have a, a kind of a long rehearsal process with with the material I mean what what, what was the kind of the 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 watershed moment if you like yeah I think it was rehearsal I think also it was that I had thus far played characters where I could sort of borrow from life quite a lot you know I remember I remember when I was doing Pride and Prejudice there was a scene where I kind of burst in crying so I'm upset about I can't even remember what and and I remember like standing in the room before I had come in sort of thinking about like terrible things happening to my family to try and make myself cry I was like I've got to make myself cry now okay so I'm gonna think about like funerals and stuff and it was you know first of all mega depressing and secondly like really hard to sustain and I think I'd kind of kind of gotten through on that kind of stuff until then, but never really. And then when I did, you know, Nina, firstly, I had this sort of very, very kind of strong kind of like probably 99.9% .9 of actors do. I felt very um, close to that character. Um, and, and so I, but, but at the same time that, you know, she goes through things that, you know, thank God I've never been through, you know, God willing, I never will. And I, it became obvious that I couldn't borrow from life anymore. And then I had to start sort of, you know, building somebody. Um, so that's what I did. I sort of started, um, you know, and I remember reading something at the time about how like Meryl Streep kind of put on, she kind of, she doesn't sort of, she puts on the character's kind of hat, you know, metaphorically, and then plays the part and then takes it off. And I felt like, that might be my way of working, you know, that I don't, that it sort of, I don't become the person. It doesn't become me or anything. I just sort of build that person completely on their own with their own kind of memories and their own references and their own life. And then I sort of do that and then I can pop back to me and very hard to talk about this without sounding really pretentious, <laughs> but that's no, 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 listen, if it, if it, if it, if it, if it makes any difference at all, this is genuinely fascinating. So please, be as pretentious as you want. Remember, we have an audience of actors and it's, it's you know, it's it's definitely going to be interesting to them. So, so please. Um, but yeah, you know, so it's like there were, there were songs that were specific to that, to, to her and to uh, Constantine. And there were songs that was, you know, there was like Russian poetry. And then I would just sort of sit backstage every night writing out stuff about her life so very it, you know it was so then i was like oh okay this is how i'm gonna do it i'm gonna i'm gonna make up other people and um and not really and like kind of not think about uh anything to do with me um and it's sort of stayed that way ever since really it, 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 the process is always about like trying to figure out that like that i suppose that, that wikipedia entry of, of who a character is 
Yeah, exactly. Right, right. And like, I don't know, there's always like some particular thing that, that the hook of somebody that's sort of like, oh, that's what they are going through. And that's why they're, and I guess a lot of the characters I've played have been kind of sort of in somehow dealing with loss or somehow dealing with grief. And I don't really have, there's no psychological reason for that because I've had the most cushy life um, and not really had to deal with anything difficult. Touch wood, oh no, everything's gonna go wrong. Um, but you know, the, the, I think there's an element to, I've been sort of fascinated by that, but um, but yeah, just sort of trying to, to keep myself out of it a bit. Is that self-protection to a degree? No, I just think it's not. I just think, you know, that's, it's sort of limiting if it's, right. if I, you know, and it's also, uh, I don't know. It's what I like about the job is not being myself. Um, yeah. And I think, it, you know, so much of the job is about empathy and, you know, other, when thinking about the experience of other people. Um, there's only so much that you can really mine from your own experience. And, and I find that that well dries really quickly, you know, particularly when you're doing theater, you've got to, you've got to imagine stuff. Otherwise it is, it, it very quickly becomes sort of, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I do wonder when you're doing, when you're doing a play, does a character kind of evolve over a run? I, I was talking recently to, to an actor who was kind of describing how, uh, he he he'd sort of made a change halfway through a, a run, almost on a whim, and it kind of changed his entire concept of of the play for the better. Have you? Can you relate to that? Is is that something that happens even beyond the rehearsal room? Yeah, I mean, I always feel like like two weeks before you close, you're finally like, oh, now I've got it. You know, it's <laughs> annoying, and I don't ever want anyone to come and see the play on previews or even press night or for the first because I just think like you never really get the play until right towards the end and then it's over, um, sort of annoying. Um, but yeah, definitely I find that. And I even, you know, even in transfer, you know, if you do something in London and then you have a pause and then you transfer it to New York and do it, you know, months later or even years later, that I think has a huge impact on that. I mean, when I did Girls and Boys in London, it was a 90 minute play. And when I did it in New York, it was 10 minutes longer. Um, oh, wow. I think was down to me. I had to talk a bit slower because it, you know, she had quite a thick East End accent, and uh, it was harder for an American audience to understand in a sort of rapid fire uh, way of speaking. Um, but yeah, I've just I don't know what changed, but stuff changed, obviously. Um, it's a, it's kind of the ethereal. It's like it's almost impossible to like try and put it into words, right? But but at the same time, that's my job. So. Yeah. What am I going to do? <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but it strikes me that, you know, you did, you did the seagull, you did the seagull in London. Uh, and then there was a little bit of a gap before you went and did it in New York. And in that gap, you made an education, which I, I mean, I, I don't know that you could have had like three, I suppose, or, or two. I don't know how you would count that more uh, transformative, more kind of like defining experiences in, in your early career. And um, I, I wonder, did, did you feel that at the time? Did it feel, I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned what you learned doing the seagull, but did, did it feel like uh, just in playing both of the, those uh, parts that, that um, things were changing, that, 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 that just kind of like something was being formed? No, not at all. <laughs> no, I did the seagull. I did like Doctor Who and then I did the right. seagull and then I did an education. It was all kind of, so it was like, you know, ping ponging all over the place. Um, and no, I didn't at all. I mean, an education was funny because it was around in my life for kind of a while before we actually shoot, shot it because it was, you right. know, director and then, um, you know, so it was, a, it was quite a long process. And by the time we were finally doing it, I was sort of, it something about it, I, you know, probably this was all, Lone Sherfig's intent and I, you know, was that it just felt really small, didn't feel I was, it, you know, it was very exciting. And I, and I was so excited to be in a film with these people. And, but it sort of felt like this is this like cool thing we're doing, this little thing, and no one will ever see it and, you know, just be fun. <laughs> and so it didn't feel like, I didn't feel any pressure. I didn't feel like particularly 
sort of like I had to carry a film or anything. It just felt like it's this little lovely independent film we're doing and it'll be in the Curzon for like a week and my mum will see it and that would be great. And so it didn't have any of that kind of, you know, how will it come out? None of it. And and she was amazing um, because I think, you know, I had felt more comfortable on stage. I hadn't felt as comfortable on camera. I was sort of, sort of un, sub, subconsciously sort of tilt myself away from lenses just because I didn't like seeing them in, you know, if I could see it, I was like, oh, I can't act. It would have to be further back. And I could do very well if the camera was like on the other side of a car or, you know, there was a big wide shot of the room. But then when they came in for a close up, I'd be like, terrible. <laughs> I just couldn't do it. So she was amazing. She was like, you know, you do know that it's sort of your, you know, this is a part of, you know, your storytelling and you, you know, so she kind of gave me lots of pep talks on how to work on camera, which I found, you know, that was that was really um, formative. Um, but it didn't feel like anything big dealy, you know, was right, there. right. So, and in fact, the first time I saw it, um, I remember calling my mum afterwards and being like, "It's so boring. It's literally, I don't do my <laughs> my face is just I just." look like a, my stupid face is just doing nothing and I'm terrible in it and everyone's going to hate me. <laughs> and I just was like, I want to come home. So I was in LA and I was about to go to Sundance and I like previewed it before we went. And I was, I was like, Oh no, it's a nightmare. I'm just, it's terrible. Have you come round since? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's probably of all the films I've done, like that's the one I've seen the most because I, you know, it was amazing to watch it in Sundance and to sort of feel that reaction. And then, you know, we did all the film festivals and, you know, and I, it was, you know, I, it didn't occur to me to not sit through the film, you know, in the way that now I will do everything I can to not have to be in that room. <laughs> but right. back then, you know, I, so yeah, I was, you know, and she's an incredible director, Lone, uh, Lone Scherfig, and, you know, it was an amazing cast. So I do love it, but, you know, you always see your flaws in, your performance and it's hard not to but I do, I do love the of course yeah yeah well it's interesting to hear you describe the experience of, of shooting it because it's certainly you know that was where we first met was I was I, I'm very fortunate to come down to that set and I remember you were in I think we were somewhere in deepest west London you were in school uniform um and uh, but what was what was really great was just kind of watching you I mean first of all it seemed like such a happy set um mm. and, and and i think maybe because you'd lived with it for so long it, it felt like you were very excited in the moment to actually be be getting it done you know to actually be kind of living you know living the experience of, of authoring this character finding this character what was it about the material that kind of connected with you uh early on i don't know i mean i i thought I don't know. I mean, I, I felt like it was a sort of, there was something about the way that she didn't quite kind of fit in. Um, well, she didn't quite know herself and she was really trying to, you know, that felt very, I felt very close to that. Like, you know, she doesn't, she just doesn't really know who she is. She's trying to figure it out through these people. She, um, you know, she's trying to find identity and, uh, and keeps finding herself in kind of regret. And, you know, there was just a lot that felt really kind of familiar. And I was only 23, I think, when I filmed it. Somewhere around there. I was trying to, I was trying to work it out myself. I think we were both around, around yeah. that sort of age, which is depressing to think about now. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, so it didn't feel that far away from me. And um, I still felt like I was 16 and, you know, so it, it really didn't feel a massive departure. Um, and yeah, so I don't, I don't know what it was particularly, but it was, it was the happiest set of just the nicest people. So much fun. Every day was fun. You know, it was a jolly. The whole thing was just a jolly. And yeah, I kind of, I just loved it. And when we were doing it is when we found out that Chiwetel Ejiofor was not intending to come to New York with the transfer of the seagull to play Tregorin. And, and so um, Peter Sarsgaard's name came up and and then Peter and I did that. So we've got- Which is fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. A couple of months off and then like, you know, went to New York and played that, which was, yeah, so much fun. 
Well, and you just got to obviously work with with Alfred Molina again on on um, Promising Young Woman as well. That must have been a nice reunion. It was so nice. I, had, I hadn't seen him in years. I mean, I hadn't seen him in like you know ten years. I don't think because I just you know he lives in LA and um, but yeah, I mean, I just love him so much. He's just the nicest and he's so brilliant and uh, and it was great because you know we didn't have any rehearsal we didn't see each other until the day of and then he came in and and did that and i was i had no idea what he was going to do which is what i love about him so i don't think you ever really know what fred's going to do um and it was just terrifying and heartbreaking and ugh, i mean just he's so brilliant and it was quite hard to, it was one of those like real moments where i was like huh <sighs> Oh fuck! I have to act. Uh, oh, sad, you know. <laughs> so like, just watching him was amazing. Yeah, yeah. Well, the one thing that I think is is kind of in Jenny that that I think is not too dissimilar to to the kind of roles that you're that you're choosing to do today is that uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, she's a, a very uncertain character and just trying to figure out who she is in the world. But 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 the one thing that's that's there in in space is just absolute authenticity in a way that we hadn't seen on screen before i don't think and and you know when i think about so many of the characters you've played it's that kind of idea of 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 what being a woman means that the cinema has kind of i think willfully ignored uh mm -hmm. in it in its history how much how important is that for you to find those kinds of parts to kind of find uh, the kind of writing that is speaking to to real experience, as opposed to this kind of like you know, the cinematic ideal of what of what womanhood means, of what of what personhood means. Yeah, I mean, I, it sort of, you know, that's the that's all I, you know, it's, it's a big part of what I'm kind of looking for and waiting for, and it means that I don't probably you know work as much as. Um, you know, I, I have to sort of, that there is a lot of kind of, um, waiting for the right thing. Um, and that, that, that in itself is, you know, such a extraordinary position to be in. So to not, to not take every job to not, you know, to be able to wait is, is a very privileged position. So I feel very lucky that I can hold fast for those jobs, but they do, I just don't have the passion for it unless it feels like a person that feels real to me. Um, a woman that feels real um and particularly now you know having children in school and i just don't you know i can't sort of up and drag everyone somewhere or you know or leave at all if if it's not something that i feel really strongly about but tall belford you know my agent she kind of released me from that such a long time ago around an education sort of when i was shooting never let me go and she said you know you're in this really rare position in our industry that you know doesn't last forever um but whilst it does you shouldn't take a part unless you can't bear the idea of anybody else doing it you know and so that became the new kind of lens through which to view everything was like can i imagine this person playing this and being like cool and if i can then i shouldn't do it but if that drives me crazy the idea of that person playing it then i then you know, then i'll fight tooth and nail for it right and and, and how much is that about um seeking the work out and how much does it land on your doorstep is it kind of is there a kind of a, a blend of both because I, I know that you have uh in the past pursued directors that you that you wanted to work with very strongly yeah it's it's, it's kind of a mix of both it's funny when tor and i were doing um well, tor and i were having what like we go for lunch like once a year and um we were having lunch once um and uh and we were sort of sort of dreaming and brainstorming about what to do. This was sort of around when I was shooting Suffragette. It might have been when I just, no, it wasn't Suffragette. It was like far from the madding crowd or something. And um, and I, and she had a napkin and she was writing stuff down and she was, she was like, work with George Clooney. And I was like, yeah, work with George Clooney. Yeah, definitely. He, I want to be directed by George Clooney and act with him. Maybe that would be great. Um, and then she was like, West End play. And then literally as she wrote it, um, the producer came over who then like six months later, I worked with who produced Skylight. And it was that, it was sort of seeing him that day and we'd, and we, he came over and sort of chatting and Tor was like, we would love to do a play. You know, we'd love to work. 
um, you know, he'd love to do some some something in London, something, you know, in a sort of West End space or whatever. And then he went away and squirreled and came back with this idea. And, you know, so it was sort of, we sort of, you know, dreamed it a little bit out loud and, you know, um, but and similarly with directors, yeah, there's de there's definitely directors where when we were sort of with Steve McQueen, I uh, basically bullied him into letting me have that job, you know. But <laughs> it was and Nicholas Winding Refn, you know, I, it's sort of yeah. I think when you see someone who makes sort of extraordinary things, you, just, you know, try and muscle your way in somehow. I I would love for you to tell the story of of meeting Steve McQueen. I know I'm sort of jumping ahead in the timeline a little bit here, but maybe that's okay. Because uh, cause it really does feel like, um, I, I mean, you know, like to, to any of us who've, who've had the privilege of, of meeting Steve, that like that idea of the kind of the persistent actress refusing to leave him alone is not necessarily uh, his favorite thing in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, well I was in London for the premiere of never let me go and i would just i think i was just shooting drive or had finished shooting drive and um and we went and i'd read shame and i immediately was like oh i have to get this job i have to get this job but i thought like there's literally no way on the planet he's ever gonna give me this part so we went i went and met him for coffee um at a hotel in Marlborough, and we um was sort of sitting down chatting and, you know, he, I was just sort of blown away by him because he's so cool, but also, you know, on first impressions a little bit, I found him a little bit intimidating, um, intimidated by his body of work and, and then of course as by his intellect. And, um, and so I think I started blathering on about how, you know, he was sort of challenging me a little bit on my work and I sort of, you know, was trying to sort of, prove my mettle as an artist and trying to sort of, you know, he was, I think he wanted me to back myself a bit more. I think I essentially was like, I'm an actor, kind of like, maybe. And he was like, no, 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 you know, are you an artist? I was like, yeah, yeah, no, I am a fucking artist. Yeah, yes. Um, and then I was like, I'm gonna go and get a fucking tattoo of a seagull on my, I was 23, by the way, 20, 23, 24. I only had a tattoo of a seagull on my wrist because I just did this, I played Nina and the seagull and like, you know, it sort of left this. And it did, it really did leave this mark on me. But I was trying, I was think I was trying to sort of like show how committed I was to, <sighs> anyway. So, and then he was like, that's cool. Um, I've got to go. And I was like, I don't really, uh, where are you going? And he was like, I'll go to Soho. I was like, I'm going to Soho. I'll come with you. <laughs> so we went outside. He hailed a cab. I was like, I'll just hop in with you to Soho. And we natter, natter, natter the whole way. Um, and sort of, you know, tried to make my case for how I really felt like I could do it. And like, you know, really think, you know, uh, I know I haven't done anything like this, but I really think I know who she is and I really think I can. Um, and I guess I just sort of, you know, whinged enough that he eventually relented and let me do it. But presumably once you had been cast, you were then committed to getting that tattoo. I got the tattoo the next day. <laughs> Fantastic. At Selfridges, because I was too afraid to go into a proper tattoo parlor, because I was not cool enough. So Selfridges, for a brief moment in time, had a tattoo artist there, and I went to Selfridges and got it. Fantastic. I love that. Is that is that is that your only tattoo so far? No, I've got a couple. So I've got that one, the seagull, which my friend drew. And then after Suffragette, I was very, very wrapped up in it all. And I got this kind of Suffragette tattoo over the top. And then I've got a couple of other little tiny ones. But they're, they're very small, so they're very easy to cover up because the makeup right. artist ah, it's so annoying. <laughs> and I don't want, I want to be friends with my makeup artist. <laughs> Presumably you now have a, a, a spot that is not Selfridges that that you know you can trust. <laughs> I have a very right. good one because I'm, I can back myself a little bit more. But back then I did not think, I thought I would get sort of thrown out of a, a proper tattoo parlor. Like, what are you doing here? Get out. But it was, uh, the Shame was such an extraordinary, extraordinary film and, 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 and your performance is, is, is kind of uh, just so raw and so real. And, and uh, you know, I, 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 I was reading an interview that you'd given around, around that time. You're talking about, uh, you know, because I, I do want to bring it back around to this, to this musical theatre right there. You know, you were talking about how hard it, it, it was to find the courage to sing. And, and 
And I remember watching you in the film thinking that that, that was such an extraordinary scene, but it was also like incredibly precedented in my mind because you had already done this incredible song with Bell and Sebastian that, that I thought was was fabulous as well. I mean, well, I have to say, like, we've, we've got to do something about this. There has to be a musical in your future. I always wanted to do cabaret. That was like my dream. I always wanted to play Sally Bowles. Um, I think I might have left it a bit too late, but I, that was what I wanted to do. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, uh, there's something so exposing about singing, uh, uh, which I'd never really, you know, I've sung in stuff. And then when we did, the, we did Inside Lewin Davis, um, the Coen Brothers film, you know, and, and kind of recording it for the, for the film was one thing, but then after the film was released, we did a concert in New York with like Patti Smith and Gillian Welch and all these incredible people. And I was like the only person who was an actor in the film who was, you know, maybe Adam Driver, I think as well, but you know, was we were sort of asked to be in the concert and I had to do a, um, a, I had to do um, Leave Nobody But The Baby from Oh Brother Where Out Thou with Rhiannon Giddens and Gillian Welch. And I've never been so nervous in my entire life. I just, I was a complete wreck. I, could, I found it so, so I, um, yeah. So I, I think it's sort of, you know, it's, it's just a different skill set. It's a different, and if it's not your sort of natural talent, I think it's harder, but I know I'd love to, I'll definitely, you know, one day, or else I'll do what Judy Dench did and sort of sneak in the back of the Les Miserables chorus during an interval. So cool. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Just don't sign up for Cats too, though. That, that would be the... No, no. <laughs> no, but I, uh, uh, it's, in, it's interesting to hear you talk about it like that, though, because I, I would have I thought that there's a kind of a... Um, that, that you know, I mean, you're absolutely right. It's a different skill set, but I, but I'd have thought like the fear, the the kind of the um, the the, the nerves. Uh, if 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 they're not equal in terms of volume, maybe they're equal in terms of just uh, where they come from, where between acting and singing. Because I mean, I think you know, it, I have to I have to imagine there are there are sometimes you where you come across material that that you know is more challenging than than others, where where you're just kind of left wondering how you're going to do it how you're going to how you're going to get there and you did that in your early career you overcame those kinds of hurdles you know when when you were on the set of pride and prejudice as you were talking about earlier and, and bleak house yeah do, i mean do I, you see a similarity there yeah i do but i think it's it's like you know i i you know sometimes because i work with you know sometimes i get asked to like you know make a speech or you know and I, i'm terrible at it like I'm really bad at public speaking I'm really bad at sort of you know sometimes you get asked to go and read like a poem at a you know a carol concert whatever and I'm bomb I'm like very bad at it and I think anything I think it, with singing it's like it's your it's you you know it's so hard to get away from it being you and that's what you know is so vulnerable about it whereas with acting you know like with girls and boys you know it's objectively quite scary doing a monologue um, but you know, I've got this voice that's, you know, not my voice and I'm wearing these clothes that aren't mine. And I'm, you know, so even with, with, with shame, I think there was, once I was in the costume and I was in the makeup and I was in the room that it was sort of, but the, it was the build up to that when it was just me. And it was the same with girls and boys with the rehearsals. I couldn't rehearse that play at all. I just kept on, I kept on, I'd get like the f halfway through the first page of the monologue. And they'd 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 brought in they you know all these lovely people from the Royal Court Theatre came like they'd bring in like twenty people to come and watch the rehearsal to sort of give me a sense of what it would be like to have an audience and I'd get like ten lines in and then I'd go I'm so sorry I can't, I can't. sorry 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 and then I just like fuck off and go outside and you know sit on the balcony and cry um, you know and so it, it, it's only when I I'm like. And I find rehearsals really icky and I find table reads really icky. And I like, until I'm like wearing the clothes that I'm, that I'm, I get so embarrassed. And so, you know, uh, so with singing, it's like, that's like, you're, you're constantly in your own clothes. You know, it's like you, just you and that side of it is like, not for me. Exposing. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, I mean, this is why I think maybe cabaret is the answer. I mean, you know, cab cabaret is all about kind of becoming these other personas, right? I mean, that's it's kind of it's kind of inherent to the to the cabaret. piece. And 
<laughs> I do cover no. it a lot in the shower. So cover it. Like, I've practiced it for like 25 years. So yeah. Well, and, and listen, I've got to say, I think I think you might know the man to do it as well, because because I mean, it seems like an open and shut case for Baz Luhrmann. Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh, that's true. That's true. Yeah, that's true. I do know a guy. <laughs> I hope right. you're planning to send an email later is all I'll say. Of course. That's why we're having <laughs> right, to come up with ideas. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly what it's for. Um, email Baz Luhrmann. <laughs> But listen, uh, you know, I, I do want to talk about uh, the Great Gatsby because you haven't done your, 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 you know, I mean, you, there was there was Wall Street, right? There was a very, very small role in in Public Enemies, but really, Great Great Gatsby is probably the biggest film I think that you've ever taken part in, in the sense of this like grand operatic Hollywood scale of a film, and and under the auspices of Baz Luhrmann, like, you know, th that's a whole other level of kind of insanity and brilliance. And uh, and there's something about the way that that man shoots a party that I think is like, uh, it, it feels like it's as fun to shoot as it is for the characters to attend. But I, I can't conceive of how that could be possible, knowing what logistically goes in. Um, and I have to ask what, what that experience was like of kind of, you know, stepping onto one of those sets, stepping into the kind of the, the scale that he works in. Yeah, I mean, it was sort of, it was very dreamlike. I remember even a couple of years afterwards, I was going for a run, um, like back in London, and I suddenly, like, so the thought crossed my mind. I was like, gosh, I was in a film with Leonardo DiCaprio. That's <laughs> mad. You know, it was like, it felt so, the whole thing just felt like very dreamlike and strange and amazing. But, you know, like, what? You know, the, it all just felt very kind of um, surreal. Um, and the experience of it was to a degree, I mean, it was like, we were all, we all went and lived in Sydney, you know, um, it was, I was sort of away from Marcus for six months. It was this mammoth production, um, you know, unlike anything I'd worked on or have done since. Um, and yeah, it was, it was sort of, you know, uh, I, I guess initially kind of overwhelming in a way. I didn't really know what to do with it. Um, but then I, you know, yeah, I guess it, you know, and it was visual in a way that nothing I'd done before was. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was extraordinary, you know, the, the acting, you know, the people I was getting to act with um, and the way that they were doing it as well. I just, that, that was the coolest thing ever to learn about Leo, that he was, as good an actor in person and as committed an actor in person as you could hope for. You know, there was sort of like, I could have, you know, could have easily been the case that we would shoot a scene together and he'd be flipping amazing when the camera was on him and then the camera would turn around and he'd just sort of phone it in, like, fair enough, you're leaning out of the camera, you can do whatever you like. But he wouldn't, he would be like sometimes even better, you know, or, or at least as good. Um, you know, there was a kind of commitment there to make the whole film as good as possible, not just him, um, which I think is, you know, is kind of remarkable, but is also probably why he is, you know, the leading man that he is. But yeah, I mean, the whole thing was sort of, it did feel very surreal, I suppose, and and, and amazing, and I loved it. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a trip, the whole thing. Did you, did you find your rhythm after a little while? Was it something that you were able to kind of just wrap your head around a little as you went along? Yeah, I did. Definitely. Yeah. It was just the first, I guess, month or so where I was just sort of trying to figure out how, and then what I eventually realized is like, oh, it's no different actually. And that, you know, right. you know, you don't need to play the room. You need to just play the character. And I think I was a bit like, oh, this is so big. And like, there's a camera on a flipping, you know, there was like one of those cameras that goes across the room. And I was like, this is blowing my mind. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, after a while, and I'd never worn a wig before, you know, it was all like, I was just in a different, um, you know, I was wearing these like real Tiffany's insane diamonds. And, you know, so the whole thing was sort of, I was, you know, letting the the outfit wear me a little bit for a while. Um, and then, yeah, then it was, then it was fun. Then it was really fun. Mm -hmm. There was, was was part of it, I wonder, like, just trying to figure out Daisy. I mean, she seems like, from, of all the characters that you've played, like, quite quite a quite a distance away from you and, 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 and kind of how you see the world. 
Yeah, a lot of it was figuring her out, but that was, I really loved that part as well. I, you know, I really kind of, in the way that I can't, I guess I don't do as much now and, you know, but I, but I was still really in a zone of like doing my homework and I, you know, read, you know, all about Zelda Fitzgerald and I, and I read all of the letters between Fitzgerald and Geneva King, who's the, you know, woman that a lot of Daisy was based on. And, you know, I, I really kind of, immerse myself in that world and I mean uh, there's a there's a chance I kind of over prepared in a way that I sort of went so far into like you know it felt like god I've got this massive job and it's you know you know it felt like sort of winning American Idol it was like you know it was sort of in the news that the, it was like you know this crazy kind of casting hunt thing and I was like what I got it this is crazy okay now I need to work like a demon to try and earn this and I think like I built, I got so in my own head, you know, with all my kind of research and all my ideas and my scrapbook. And, you know, and then I got there and was like, oh, ah. you know, I think I might have slightly over um, eggs the pudding a bit and then, you know, got there and was like, oh no, just sort of try and, you know, act well. Um, so yeah, I think there was a bit, you know, I felt the pressure a bit at the beginning. And then I, when then I kind of relaxed into it a bit more. Mm. Do you, do you think that kind of, that kind of feeling that, that early feeling is, has that put you off like going back into into big cinema in any way or is it uh, is it more about the materials i mean you know based on what you were saying earlier i i do wonder like how much how, how much you get a script like promising young woman at 100 million dollars do you know what i mean yeah they do they don't tend to come together um yeah it's just been material it's just been the 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 best scripts the best kind of writing the best directors you know and sometimes it's not like you know you know, with Mudbound, it was, you know, I saw Pariah and and I just thought, this is nuts. She's just made a perfect film. Like whatever yeah. she does, it's gonna be amazing. So I wanted to be in Mudbound. It wasn't initially the character that drew me in. And although I ended up really loving that part and, and loved the experience, but but it was, you know, so sometimes it sort of works more like that. Um, but yeah, it just hasn't been, hasn't, you know, if it, if it happened that, an amazing script also coincided with, you know, a huge budget with really nice catering. I would totally, totally dive in. <laughs> you seen. really, the, the really nice catering cannot be overestimated sometimes. Catering, yeah, but do you know what? That's, to be fair, we had incredible catering on Promising Young Woman and we made that film on a shoestring. So, but the, what they did brilliantly was they kept it really simple. They did like really simple, lovely, I could, the, Talk about the catering on Promising Young Woman. That's a separate chat, though. We'll talk about I, that. Listen, I, I'd be up for the. Let's do a whole version of this where we just talk about the catering on every film. So, I would, I would watch that. Prof services is not a thing in England. You know, we it just isn't. Don't, yeah, we get it. We get like a table with like some custard creams and like some lukewarm tea. You know. My theory is it's because it rains all the time. So like, whenever I look at that table on a film set, it's just like soggy. I don't know if that would work if it if it had all the same accoutrements that you get in in, in the US. You know, but in the US you have like a van where you can go and ask for any sandwich that you want. True. Or like an iced coffee. I mean it's revolutionary. <laughs> it's just it doesn't bear thinking about really. And I feel like we have gone off, off topic here a little bit. Um but it's interesting to hear you talk about uh, Dee Reese there, because I, 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 you know, I, I know that you've talked in the past about, you know, I mean, you, you mentioned earlier, in fact, like, you know, that kind of list that you and Tor put together of just these crazy uh, out of the way ideas. Um, but how important is your relationship with, with a director in, in the making of a film? It seems like very essential to you. And also, I'm curious, like, who's on that list now? Um, yeah, it is. Uh... It's my favorite thing in the world when I've got that relationship with a director, um, like I have with Dee and like I have with Emerald. Um, I mean, lots of the reason I wanted to work with Emerald is because I wanted her to be my best friend. That was sort of pretty, you know, the script is great, but I was like, oh, I want to be your best friend. You're so cool. Um, but no, I, I do, I love having a close relationship. You know, it's, it's certainly, the, you know, the same, the relationship I had with Steve McQueen on Shame, it was like the months leading up to that to filming that we didn't really rehearse but we just spent time and we just talked and you know he'd send me you know pictures and pieces of art and songs and you know i i love that i don't you know i like building that relationship and feeling like you know at the end of a take or at the end of a scene you can sort of look at the director and they can give you like a little nod and you're like cool i can go home now and i don't and i don't need anything more than that and i really don't like kind of 
you know any more than that i just it's like nice feeling like cool we've got this like we're a little team you know that feels really nice um and that's and i've had that with you know with almost everyone i've worked with um and it's yeah it's a big deal for me mm. well i mean talking about teams i have to imagine you know sarah gavron directed suffragette you know abby morgan wrote the screenplay you had alice and owen and Faye were producing the film you know you starred with meryl streep helena bonham carter and marie duff i mean extraordinary group of people to, to do that project with i can kind of understand why you added to your tattoo collection there oh yeah and i texted the rest of them and i was like girls i'm gonna get a tattoo <laughs> it's gonna say love the overcomer you know from the suffragette magazine thing and they were like that's great and i was like does anyone else want to do it no, just me, don't worry about it um i'll go on my own but yeah no it was nuts i mean it was like the most amazing group of women and you know the whole experience of that film was just I've got a little present from from Helena that sits on the top of our one of the our toilet in the house and it it's a little glass bottle and it's got a photo of me and Helena and Anne Marie like in absolute hysterics um and it just has a little label like it's a you know like a potion that says um bottled hysteria um and it's from one of the night shoots on suffragette and it was like that it was like hysterical um which is you know but considering the film was quite serious, um, you know, it's a real testament to the kind of environment that Sarah created on set. But it was, yeah, it was so much fun. Loved it. Because what's interesting to me is you, you've made two films now recently where, where uh, or, or sorry, well, you've made one and I think you're about to make another where you're playing uh, real people. And you haven't really played real people before in the past, but but a lot of your films have have kind of circumnavigated around real topics. The suffragette is kind of like the 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 prototypical example of that in the sense of like, you know, you are telling these real stories. Uh, it just so happens that your character is kind of, I guess she's kind of like a an amalgam or a, or an invention, right? Um, and I, 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 do, I do wonder how important it is for you to kind of dive into you know, you mentioned doing it for the Great Gatsby, diving into the, the kind of the history, the research uh, around around these kind of time periods. These uh, what 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 these women's lives would have been like. Yeah, I mean, definitely for suffragette, that was really important um, because she is she is an invention, but she is an amalgam of so many women's experiences, and and that was that was one of those that was an instance where I did you know read around quite a lot, and we also had sort of a suffragette workshop um, as a cast before as well, where we sort of had different people coming in and sort of, you know, sort of like a little series of mini lectures. And we even had someone come in to talk to us about the experience of being force fed. And um, he himself had gone, you know, as sort of an, for an experiment, had had sort of agreed to be force fed and sort of talked us through what that was like and, you know, read tons of prison transcripts and diaries and letters and things. Um, so in that, yeah, for, for stuff like that, I think it's really, um, you know, you kind of have to in a way. Um, but there's also, you know, there's a lot of the, a lot of these characters feel like, yes, there are kind of historical, um, you know, societal things to think about that, that are important, but a lot of it feels, I mean, like I, I, I don't really think of Jeanette and wildlife as being a period character. She feels very modern to me. Um, Laura and Mudbound feels very modern to me, you know, and, and you do, obviously you're aware of the sort of, um, the stuff that's going on, but it, it I think it, to the other way, you could, there's a risk of being kind of sucked into period drama world if you, you know, it, and you've got to understand the circumstances that someone's living in, of course, and like what they're dealing with in their everyday life. But much beyond that, I think it can become a bit of a distraction that, you know, because really, we're, we're all kind of experiencing the same stuff to varying degrees, mm. you know, today. so mm. trying to feel like, you know, something that, you know, can, it feels something feels universal and contemporary about it. But I, I do wonder if, if Suffragette, if, if playing that part kind of opened you up to being a little more uh, outspoken, whether it had a kind of an effect just to see the way, you know, just to see what these women kind of, kind of faced by just sort of asking for very simple rights, whether mm. it kind of, it, whether it, whether it can't not have a kind of an effect on you and how you, and how you kind of want to look at the world and speak to the world. 
Yeah, I think so. I think it also comes with a, you know, right after I filmed, right before I filmed Suffragette, I went on my first trip with War Child, which is the children in conflict charity that I work with. Um, I went to the Democratic Republic of Congo for a week with them and saw the work that they were doing. So it kind of coincided with a time when I was starting to feel like, you know, some like if you've got a if you've got a platform like what are you going to talk about and and that became uh you know the rights of children in conflict and um the right to childhood became kind of a you know a thing that i became passionate about and then became more outspoken about and then when we released the film obviously you know we were asked lots of questions around it and um you know so you, you are given a kind of platform to talk about this stuff and yeah i i, I certainly felt like i'd kind of reached the point where i didn't feel nervous about saying how I felt about things. Because mm. I suppose, you know, there's there's a uh, a kind of a, a debate that rages about about the role of art as as entertainment or as or as as politics. Right. And and it, it strikes me that it strikes me that you can't really separate the two that like like any any piece of art is inherently both entertaining and political. Right. It, it kind of has to be. Mm. Yeah, I think so. I, I mean, Yes, I think so. And I think, you know, if you're, if you're going to talk about anything, I'd rather talk about, I'd rather elevate the work of people who are doing brilliant things like right. the world than I would talk about, you know, my first date with my husband or what my favorite color is. You know? So it's like, if we're going to, you know, if we're going to, if you, you know, I've got this, this platform, I'd rather elevate people who are doing stuff that matters than talk about things that really don't matter. Right. Um, the the interview is inevitably, you know, 20% about the film, 80% about your life or trying to be. Um, and that's if you're lucky. So you know, like if you can, if you can, if you have that opportunity far better that it, you know, it, it sort of draws attention to things that, that matter. Mm. Do you think, I do wonder, you know, you, you obviously, it's the sort of the nature of the beast to do to do kind of promotion for every project that you do but i i wonder how how much you're kind of uh, i wonder how much more maybe you're speaking about yourself in just the work that you choose if if the if the body if the body of work were to be looked at as a whole does that represent you know carrie mulligan more perhaps than the questions that you get asked in in press junkets yeah that's I... a incredibly i don't know i don't know where that lofty question came from but i'm, I'm Lofty question. No, I, I think so. And I think I remember like I remember us being asked constantly on the on the uh, press on the press trail for suffragette if we were feminists. And we were like, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like well, of course. It was so strange. It was, you know, was, we've just made this film about the suffragette movement that's been right. written and produced and stars women. Yeah. We do, <laughs> like we are, <laughs> you know. Um, so yeah, I do, I do, I think it, you know, um, I think it, you know, hopefully, you mean, you know, you, you're, but, but also I'm not, I'm not interested in playing heroic women necessarily, or, or you know, showing women um, in just in, in, in a good light in their, in their, on their best day. I think it's far more important in a way that we're, that we look at, you know, all the ways and, which it's possible to fail and uh, as a mother or as a sister or as a daughter or as a friend um you know or, or all of our struggles i think you know you've got to steve mcqueen when we were doing shame was sort of you know he said you know essentially the art is holding up a mirror you you know people need to be able to see something they can recognize in the mirror and i think that's true for so much for women so much for for young women particularly that you when you watch things on screen that you can see something you can identify with that feels true and, you know, honest and, and necessarily not perfect and mm. uh, something that, you know, otherwise it's, yeah, I, I just think you, you, you don't, you know, you don't feel seen at all as an audience member. Um, so I, I'm probably more drawn now to women who are seen kind of in all their flaws as opposed to you know women who are kind of crushing it 
Because it's not, uh, you know, it's it's just, I think like people will want to sort of, I think people kind of want initially to sort of take a, a very critical response to that, that, like, you know, that it's somehow a negative thing. And yet, actually, I think there must be a, a huge catharsis, although I know that there's a huge catharsis in seeing a character that that is going through the same, you know, that is that is struggling with the same fuck ups that you're struggling with. You know, I think like that J Jeanette in, in, in wildlife is, is kind of a perfect example of that. You know, I think what she's going through as as kind of as as kind of heartbreaking as it is to watch at certain parts of in that in that film it, it doesn't feel in any way unfamiliar it doesn't feel in any way unjustified or or, or it actually it, it feels it feels like just the the, the frailty of human nature and on, on, on a really kind of primal level and and there's a catharsis to seeing that reflected in on screen i think yeah i i did completely i had a huge deal of empathy for jeanette um but that's not, not to say that I necessarily understood her at all when I read the script. Right. Like, huh? Why is she doing all this? And this is a bit, you know, and I and I totally judged the character. And um, but but then, you know, working on it, I it, it became so clear what she was going through. And I and I've it was a real kind of. You know, it's sort of I, I remember thinking when I was reading the script, like, oh, I remember being like 23 driving around LA and listening to this song and thinking like, wow, everything is open. I can do whatever I like. Where am I going to go from here? <gasps> you know, and I, and I, when I read the script, I I'd like a proper sense memory of that moment thinking like, gosh, now I'm 32, how old was I? 31, 32, whatever. Um, and all of this time has gone and I've made all these decisions and here I am with my life. And, you know, I've got, a almost two year old and another one on the way and you know and that's all great you know it's all good things but it's like that's gone now and there's no going back and I can't redo any of that can't do it any differently and and I felt like gosh that's what Jeanette's going through she's she's made all her decisions and she's and there's all these versions of herself that she could have been and none of them are ever going to happen and you know and she's just realized that when you meet her at the beginning of the film like just that um and so, yeah, I felt like I totally identify with that. You know, I wouldn't probably work it out the way that she does, but totally, you know, and it was interesting releasing the film because there was, you know, this sort of weird, like quite sort of aggressive reaction to her, you know, she's a terrible mother and a terrible wife. And I thought, Jake just fucks off to go and fight a wildfire. <laughs> like he just abandons them, you know, with no income in, yeah. you know, and doesn't say when he's coming back and potentially could just wander off and get burned up in a forest. And like, there's zero judgment of his character. He's totally like, he's following his passion, his dream. He needs to, he's having a thing. But for her, it was like, oh, she's the worst. And I thought, like, what? This is crazy, you know? Um, and I, I really loved her as a, as a character. I love playing her. Um, but yeah, it was, it was an interesting reaction. Well, and I think wildlife and, and, and also promising young women does such a fantastic job of, of, uh, you know, I guess I can't imagine, you know, Cassie, I, I, I can't imagine you haven't had similar feedback or maybe you haven't. I, I don't know. I'd be curious to know, actually. I guess I haven't, you know, what's, uh, no, I don't think I really have. I've, but I think I've been protected from it probably because I'm not on social media and on Twitter and I've only spoken to journalists. Um, right. so polite. <laughs> so, you know, cause I've only seen the film once in Sundance. So, you know, at the after party, Emerald and I just sort of walked around like zombies trying to process it and then went home and then we flew home the next day and that was it sort of thing. So uh, I haven't sort of really had that. I think people, the journalists who we've spoken to, have been people who've liked the film, you know, and mm. wanted to do the interview. So I've had a very, very nice, rosy thing. I don't want to know the bad things. <laughs> well, no, but it's it's. It, I think it's interesting because uh, there's a point of comparison because you know, obviously, it's hard to um, justify. I suppose maybe that's not even maybe that's not even true i was going to say it, 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 it it's hard to justify some of the things that cassie does but i think the justification is 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 kind of very strong as well as well you know it's it's a it's an incredibly complex piece um mm. because well, no, you know it, it is about you know essentially the fact that revenge is futile you know so she yeah. really so so there's no endorsement really of anything that she's doing um right. 
but it's interesting that you know i the 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 reaction that i did have from a couple of people a couple of journalists was like you know she's crazy and that really struck me because i did you know because i think of all the films where men have gone to much more violent um and drastic and dramatic lengths for somebody yeah. they love a daughter a wife um and never have i heard them described as crazy or you know a sort of man who's on a mission for his for the person he loves and that's that's fine but you know cassie does these things that you know that are largely psychological games pretty much all bar the end of the film and 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 you know a, a kind of a couple of people were were sort of questioning her sanity um so that was kind of telling but i do think yeah i think she's you know the means that she's you know her methods are totally morally questionable um but you know she's but she's right uh, and she that's it yeah that's the complicated thing that's the complicated thing yeah. um yeah the method is is um is uh, and but what's great about what emerald's written the way that she writes it is that you see her kind of being held accountable for it just by herself you know i think the reaction that she has after she goes into the dean's office that scene with connie Britton, she's in the car afterwards that's not somebody who's sort of reveling in their victory that's somebody who feels like appalled with themselves um mm -hmm. And then she smashes up a car and feels appalled and afraid of herself, you know. So, you know, she's she, you're getting to see the the real impact of of how futile revenge is, and that you know, even in the moments when she's getting the answer that she wants, even in the moment when the dean says, "You're right," you know, I, I you're right. Okay, is that what you want to hear? You're right. You know, there's a sort of like there's like an emptiness in the victory. It's like it, it mm. actually got it and now i mean it shouldn't you know it sort of feels even worse now actually um and i think that's that's what's so brilliant about the way that emerald's written it is the sort of whip smart version is like she sort of sachets away but it's like that's just not that's just not honest that's not you know she is a person Absolutely. who does have a conscience and she's not a sociopath and you know she is feeling deeply throughout Absolutely, absolutely, and I had to. I have to imagine uh, the the experience of of reading the script. I mean, I was I, I watched the film again this morning, and they'd sent me a copy of the script, so I was sort of leafing through it as as I was watching, and it's it's extraordinary to see how it's all there and how the how just the kind of the the experience of reading it connects so intensely with the. I, I do wonder when when you read it, you know, without having had the benefit of obviously seeing the film beforehand, whether it had that same kind of vi visceral impact that the film has been having on, on audiences as it's played. Yeah, it did. Yeah. I remember reading it. I like read it on my phone because I started, I was like, oh, it's the script from Emerald. And I'd met her, well, I'd met her when we were kids and I, but I'd also met her like a couple of months before just for like half mm. an hour at my friend's house. And so I was like, oh, it's the thing from Emerald. And I started reading it and then I was like, and then I stood in my kitchen for like an hour and I just didn't, stop reading it off my phone because you know I couldn't stop reading it and I just thought oh, I have to do this I have to do this and I you know and then immediately kind of met Emerald like two days later and said yes within about five minutes of sitting down with her but yeah it had that impact um but I didn't have I didn't know it'd be this you know I I I, I couldn't have I couldn't have I just don't have it in and I couldn't have imagined this you know she's just She's a genius. I really, mm. I really a genius. So, um, you know, it's just amazing to to see the world kind of discovering Emerald Fennell. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, what to think? I mean, obviously, you know, she has uh, extraordinary credits to her name already. But to think that this is her her debut feature film is is just sort of a mind blowing thing, really. It's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. I just, but I, I love it. And that's why, you know, we've done so much press with film and, you know, doing it over like a year, really. Um, but it's just so fun to watch people kind of discover her and discover the film and, you know, appreciate what she's done. I think it's, I think she's completely remarkable. I want to work with her until I die. She's just, yeah. I can't, I kind of feel like I got so lucky to jump on the bandwagon before, you know, I feel like, you know, I'll be, 
I'll be like right at the beginning of the clip reel for her like greatest, greatest, you know, when she wins her lifetime achievement award, I'll be right at the beginning. Um, yeah, she's she prime placement. Make. Absolutely. I love that. Um, <laughs> but well, I, I do wonder though, I mean, you know, like obviously Paul did such a fantastic job on, on wildlife and, and, and now, uh, Emerald, of course, you know, I should say for anyone who's lived under a rock for the last six months and haven't heard this already, just an incredible actor as, as well, you know, just blew us away recently in, in, uh, in the crown, uh, as, as Camilla Parker was. Um, but I, I do wonder, do you think there's, do you think there's kind of like a higher level when you're working with a director who understands performance to the, in the way that Paul and, and Emerald do? Do you think it kind of heightens things or, or changes things? Do you think there's something uh, more intense in the relationship? I think for me, uh, it sort of scares me uh, into trying, I did not trying harder, but like I, I was so intimidated to work with Paul because um, I think he's one of the greatest actors of our generation and I was and I was so intimidated to work with him and knowing that Zoe was back in New York watching the rushes because Zoe Kazan both knowing both of those things scared the shit out of me and I um and I really felt like yeah it sort of ups your game I think to work with an actor who's also directing you um so even just from that perspective and with Emerald Thank God I actually hadn't seen her act because I hadn't, you know, I hadn't seen any of the Call the Midwife and I and The Crown hadn't come out yet. So thankfully, I didn't know how amazing she was. Um, you had shared a scene with her before. But... I had shared a scene. She had played Bitchy Friend in Nightclub. That's true. Um, but yeah, I mean, aside from that, um, I didn't know you know, what an amazing actor she was. So I, you know, but if I had, I would have been crippled by anxiety. So it was a good thing, but yeah, I mean, she's, the thing about Em though, is that she's also, she, I think she's just a born director as well. I don't think it's, you know, it's the same with, with Paul. I think he is too. I think it's like the actor director thing is not really, I think that's, they put on a totally different hat you know, and they are, they're in a completely different role. And yes, they understand performance and they understand what it's like to be an actor and that sort of, you know, how exposing it is and and the, the issues that you can run into. But I think more than anything, they're just both born directors and they are both born actors. Um, they're just lucky to have both things. Um, so I think that sort of, yeah, I think it, it, it's, it's a it's they're both unique skill sets and they have them both wholly it's not sort of they don't really bleed into each other as much as you'd think i don't think well i, I i'm curious if you've ever felt the pull of 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 you know directing or or you know i mean margot robbie produces promising young woman and she's had this incredible run as a, as a producer as, as well as an actor have you felt the pull of kind of behind the camera at all no not really i mean i'm i'm <laughs> Uh, I definitely have no designs to direct. I just, I just don't, I just don't have any, I think it looks so hard. <laughs> I just, yeah. it looks so hard and, um, yeah, I just don't, I don't, that's not sort of in my, I don't think that's in my wheelhouse and producing, I think, you know, is, yeah, I think, you know, that there's definitely a world in which I would sort of produce a bit more, but um, I feel like such an actor for hire. I think if I produce things, it would be things that I w wouldn't act in because I feel like my, you know, my dream, very, very lucky, um, but dream scenario is that I get a script kind of lands in my inbox and I read it and I'm like, <gasps> and I call Tor and I'm like, Tor, oh my God. And then, you know, and then I'm sort of like in, and then we start shooting it like three months later. That's sort of, and I, I, there's, you know, I've had a tendency to sort of attach, you know, or, or kind of go down a bit of a producing road with something or developing something. And then by the time, you know, I just sort of lose, I just lose the passion for it. So I think, I think, yeah, I think if I produce things, it might be things that I'm not going to be in maybe as much. Right, right. Well, I, I should just talk briefly. We are running out of time, sadly, but we should talk just briefly about uh, your next film. You mean you had you, you, another actor, director, Bradley Cooper, um, and it's the story of... Uh, tell us a little bit about it for people who won't be familiar. The film is Maestro. Yes, the film is Maestro. Yeah, so it's about... Um, 
Leonard Bernstein and and his wife, and um, it's a, I guess, a kind of exploration of his life as an artist in its different forms and their relationship. And yeah, it's an incredible script. Um, and yeah, I've I've known Bradley kind of on and off uh, for a long time, and he's always come to see me in plays. Um, which is so didn't he, res didn't he rescue you from a concussion? Yeah, he did. Yeah. He came to see me in Girls and Boys and it was the f opening night of Girls and not the opening night, not the press night, but it was the first preview. And it was the only show he could come to because he was about to leave town. Um, and he came to the uh, press night, uh, opening night. And in the last 20 minutes of the play, in one of the scene changes, the, the curtain came down in a blackout on my head. Um, you know, like a wooden, wooden curtain. Um, curtain always sounds like it was sort of fluffy. It's like, it was very like safety. It was the safety curtain thing. Right, yeah. right, right. Um, but it was in a blackout and nobody saw, like not even the crew, because we didn't have infrared cam, you know, we didn't have like um, night vision cameras or whatever. So I just carried on um, and got to the end of the play and then walked off stage and just burst into tears. And I was sort of sitting in my dressing room on the floor, crying to the director saying like, I feel really weird. I feel like I'm gonna throw up. I don't feel good. I, feel, I don't feel good, it really hurts. And I couldn't stop crying and, and for someone from production came in, they were like, Bradley Cooper's just outside. And the dressing room in that theater doesn't have like a full wall. It just has like a partition because it's this tiny little theater. And, um, and I was like, Bradley, you can come in. So he walked in. I was like, I just feel terrible. He was like, we're going to take you to the emergency room. We're going to go now. And I was like, okay. Like picked me up, walked me out, put me in the car um, and took me to the emergency room. I was fine. I missed like five shows and then went back. But um, but yeah, so it was so sweet. But yeah, it's, I, I, I'm, I'm, it's such a dream part. I can't wait, can't wait, can't wait to do it. And he's such an extraordinary director and obviously an extraordinary actor. So it's very exciting. Well, and you, you obviously haven't started shooting yet because you've made 90 minutes for me, but I, are you, um, are you kind of in research mode at the moment? Are you kind of looking, what's that entailing? Uh, talking to family and um, learning Spanish and wow. uh, reading reading tons around their life as much as I can. You know, it's quite, it's, it's there's, we've got a bit of a luxury of time because we've got a bit longer before we do it. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's such a, and it's a kind of alien world to me in a kind of a great way, you know, the whole classical music world. Um, so it's, it's nice, it's, you know, it's one of the great things about our job is you get to, dive into something that you know nothing about and um right. you know that's quite uh yeah quite fun well and just and just finally like i have to ask about your immediate next project which is like you're flying to new york to host saturday night live which i just like i i i, I don't want to terrify you but that to me sounds like the most scary thing on the planet i know, I know. and i said to marcus last night i was like we're really actually it's quite soon, like, you know, because it felt like, you know, because it's sort of been in the works for, you know, a couple of months. And, you know, when it first came up, I was like, oh, gosh, this is crazy. Yeah, fuck it. This is awesome. Like, yes, what an honor. Like, how amazing. And then the closer it's gotten, the more the more real it feels and the more I. And so I've been sort of, you know, texting people I know who've done it and, you know, watching lots of things and uh I don't, yeah, it's terrifying, but you know, it's a, you can't, it's, it's an opportunity of a lifetime. It's a, it's an institution. It's sort of, you know, it's such a, it's, it's remarkable. And I, you know, I think you, you've, you've got to give these things a go. And, um, I'm really excited about it. Actually, I'm really excited to just be in a room with other actors and like get to mess around, you know, I'm, I'm, started to like do lots of voices in bedtime stories for my kids and they hate it. <laughs> so I think like it would be quite good for me to be, you know, working probably for a minute. <laughs> Absolutely. The, the, the kids are always going to be the, the most critical voice in the household, I'm sure. So yeah. Mommy, stop it's... It. yeah it. <laughs> well, listen, best of luck with it. I think I, you know, I think you're going to have an absolute blast and I can't wait to see it. Um, Carrie Mulligan, thank you so much for for spending this time with me. I, it's been it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. It was lovely, lovely chatting to you.